This is Unsung History, the podcast where we discuss people and events in American history that haven't always received a lot of attention. I'm your host, Kelly Therese Pollack. I'll start each episode with a brief introduction to the topic and then talk to someone who knows a lot more than I do. Be sure to subscribe to Unsung History on your favorite podcasting app so you never miss an episode. And please, Tell your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, maybe even strangers to listen to. On this episode, we're discussing the Southern Strategy, an electoral approach by the Republican Party to capture the votes of white Democrats in the South. Before we get to that party switch, though, I think it would be helpful to give a quick overview of the history of the Republican Party. If you remember your U.S. history courses, or you've watched Hamilton recently, you might recall that while George Washington opposed political parties, they sprang up pretty much immediately upon the country's founding. By the 1830s, Alexander Hamilton's Federalist Party had dissolved and Thomas Jefferson's Democratic-Republican Party had become the Democratic Party, headed by Andrew Jackson. Jackson's opponents formed the Whig Party, which managed to elect four presidents, all of whom are included in the Simpsons song, We Are the Mediocre Presidents. That brings us to the 1850s, when the Whig Party fell apart over slavery. In 1854, Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas, a Democrat, introduced a bill that became known as the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. When enacted, the law organized the territories of Kansas and Nebraska, allowing them to decide for themselves whether to allow slavery and it explicitly repealed the earlier Missouri Compromise, which had outlawed slavery above the 3630 latitude line in the unorganized areas of the Louisiana Territory. Groups who opposed the Kansas-Nebraska Act started to organize themselves, and at one such meeting, on March 20, 1854, in Ripon, Wisconsin, the Republican Party was founded. News of the new party spread quickly, and former members of the Whig and Free Soil parties, as well as disaffected Democrats, joined their local chapters. By 1856, the National Republican Party had formed. It's important to note here that the Republican Party at this point was largely not made up of abolitionists. Their goal was to stop slavery from spreading to the West, which would increase the power of the slave states. With the Democrats running two opposing candidates in 1860, Whig turned Republican Abraham Lincoln won the presidential election with just under 40% of the popular vote, leaning on the strength of his showing in the free northern states, along with California and Oregon. Southern states reacted to the election by seceding. Although Lincoln opposed slavery, his goal was always primarily to save the Union, and he upset many abolitionists with his moderation. The Emancipation Proclamation, signed on January 1, 1863, was as much a strategic move as a moral one. But with it, and with Republicans passing the 13th Amendment, which finally abolished slavery, and radical Republicans passing further legislation to protect civil rights for African Americans, the loyalty of Southern whites to the Democratic Party, and of African Americans to the Republican Party, was solidified. These loyalties remained strong even while the presidency flipped back and forth between the two parties over the next few decades, and while the two parties themselves changed, with the Republicans shifting from the party of federal power and economic liberalism 
to the party of corporations and economic conservatism, and the Democrats shifting from the party of states' rights to the party of big government economic liberalism. In 1932, Democrat Franklin Delano Roosevelt won only 23% of the black vote in his overwhelming victory over incumbent Republican Herbert Hoover. By 1936, FDR won 71% of the black vote, having convinced African-American voters who saw how they benefited from the New Deal. For a time, the Democratic Party managed to hold together an unlikely coalition that included both African-Americans and Southern white segregationists. But the approval of a civil rights platform in the Democratic Convention in 1948, where incumbent Democrat Harry Truman was renominated, was a bridge too far for some. Governor Strom Thurmond of South Carolina ran for president and lost on the ticket of the states' rights Democratic Party, a.k.a. the Dixiecrats. Republicans, seeing an opening, started to court the Dixiecrats. But the 1954 Brown v. Board of Education decision, which was authored by Republican Chief Justice Earl Warren, didn't help the Republicans' cause with the Dixiecrats. When then-Vice President Richard Nixon ran for president in 1960 on the Republican ticket, he did so with a robust civil rights plank and a liberal Republican running mate, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. When Nixon lost that election to Democrat John F. Kennedy, Republicans doubled down on Operation Dixie to increase their reach in the southern states, in many places happily recruiting segregationists. As Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater put it, they weren't going to win the black vote in 1964 or 1968, so, quote, we ought to go hunting where the ducks are, unquote. Goldwater touting his vote against the 1964 Civil Rights Act lost the presidential election in 1964, but he won five states in the Deep South, a sign that the Southern strategy was beginning to work for the Republican Party. In 1968, Nixon ran again, this time following a more nuanced version of Goldwater's blueprint. Allying himself with the newly Republican Strom Thurmond, and selecting for his running mate, Maryland Governor Spiro Agnew, who had famously berated civil rights leaders after a riot. All while denying that they were following a Southern strategy at all. However quiet Nixon's coded language might have been, Thurmond was less circumspect, saying, quote, If Nixon becomes president, he has promised that he won't enforce either the Civil Rights or the Voting Rights Acts. Stick with him. Unquote. Segregationist George Wallace, running an independent campaign, won the Deep South in 1968. But Nixon won the rest of the South. In 1972, with no Wallace to spoil the vote, the incumbent Nixon swept the former Confederacy winning 80% of the white vote in the South. With Wallace voters from 1968 voting for Nixon in 1972 by a three-to-one margin. It would take decades for the shift to play out, with state legislatures in the South still dominated by Democrats well into the 21st century. Joining me now for a deep dive on the Southern strategy is Dr. Kevin M. Cruz, professor of history at Princeton University, author of several books on the political and social history of 20th century America, and co-editor with fellow Princeton historian Dr. Julian E. Zelizer of Myth America, Historians Take on the Biggest Legends and Lies About Our Past. Dr. Cruz also contributed an essay to the collection titled 
the Southern strategy. In your heart, you know he's right. So go, go, water. Let's go, go, water. Let's go, go, water all the way. Just make a note to cast your vote for Mr. USA. Hi, Kevin. Thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure to be here. Yes. So I'm excited to talk about the Southern strategy, but first I want to talk a little bit about Myth America and how this book came together. Can you talk a little bit about the the impetus for the book, how how you and Julianne Zelazar got this book together? Yeah, well, the book was uh, many years in the making. Uh, and the origin, uh, at, I guess the furthest point back was a uh, conversation with my agent trying to capture the kind of things that historians like me were doing on Twitter. Wouldn't this be a good book? And I didn't want to do an entire book of kind of fact checking Twitter threads. It didn't seem right, but but the, the, that was the kind of the, the the germ of an of the idea, which was to to use that kind of approach of challenging uh, uh, and pushing back against the myths and the lies that are being spread uh, largely by the right in the Trump era, and 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 trying to find a way to to turn that into something uh, a little more substantial than Twitter. And uh, when we look around, we saw that uh, Julie and I were doing this, but lots of other historians were on on Twitter, on Facebook, on Substack, on TV and radio and things like that, uh, challenging these things. And we thought, well, let's get these people who are already hard at work pushing back against a lot of these myths and lies in the public sphere and do what we do best, which is to uh, to, to write uh, uh, pieces grounded in the evidence uh, meant to reach a general audience. Yeah, so let me ask about that for a second, because this is uh, obviously directed at a general audience. It can be well understood by people who are not historians, but it is grounded in facts, in archives. There are a huge number of notes in this book, as you would expect in an academic book. So can you talk a little bit about public history and and how what it, what it takes to sort of get the message to a general audience in a way that can be understood while still being yeah. very grounded in the way that academics are. That's a great question. And as you know, yeah, the essays are deeply uh, grounded in uh, in the historical literature and in the archives. And they're not meant for other historians because in a lot of ways we're taking what is kind of conventional wisdom and, and standard accounts in the historical profession and using those to correct misconceptions the public has. Now to do that, we've got to talk to the general public uh, they can be reached. Uh, and uh, most people aren't idiots, but they aren't specialists, right? And so what that means is being very careful to speak to them as you would, you know, a, a colleague uh, in, in another department, uh, someone who's not an academic, you know, as we would write uh, an op-ed piece. And when you write an op-ed piece, editors always use this phrase of, we're trying to reach a general, generally educated audience of non-specialists. Uh, and so people who are you know, a, a bright but don't have any particular background in this topic and, and want to know more. So you can speak to them in depth and detail, but you've got to avoid kind of exclusionary language. You've got to avoid kind of seminar table jargon uh, and, and academic shorthand and really just speak to them as clearly as you can. And, and again, the people that we had in mind for this project were ones that we'd already seen were doing this, uh, you know, doing this in a variety of other form and and we knew could do it well here. Yeah. Yeah. And it works really well. I think any of these chapters as a standalone essay, you know, really does give you a good overview. Some of the stuff I, I knew in deep ways in certain topics, but it was good to see the the overview. So let's talk about the Southern strategy then. So sure. first of all, let's talk about how it's a myth, because, you know, I think a lot of people just accept it as fact that, yes, of course, there's a Southern strategy that happened. So what is the the myth around this? Yeah. If you told me, you know, a decade ago that I would be writing a, a chapter about a, a popular myth, the idea that the Southern strategy didn't exist would have never entered my mind, because it is such, and not just conventional wisdom for historians, but the general public. I mean, so, so the Southern strategy I should start with is the uh, the approach the Republican Party takes in the 1960s, largely under the direction of Richard Nixon, but some other folks, to uh, expand its uh, its presence, to reach into the South, where it had never been popular. It always was dismissed as the party of Abraham Lincoln, uh, the party of uh, the North in the Civil War, uh, and to make inroads there by making peace with uh, white conservatives who were segregationists, uh, basically to bury the Republican Party's uh, rich tradition of racial liberalism, uh, 
and instead to make common cause with with white supremacists uh, in, in a lot of ways, at least to make peace with them. And again, this was not a controversial fact. Uh, uh, throughout the 1960s, uh, this is openly discussed in the media, not just by reporters observing it from the outside, but Nixon's strategists talk about this openly in the papers. Nixon uh, in uh, uh, private speeches, we have recordings of this, we have it in the archives. Uh, this is all over the historical record. So much so that uh, about a decade ago, Republican leaders themselves were apologizing for this. Ken Melman, the head of the Republican National Committee, apologized to the NAACP for the Southern strategy. Michael Steele, the first African-American to be the head of the RNC, uh, did the same. And this was an effort, and I think an honest one during the Bush era, to really turn the page, to say, look, that was a, an older chapter of the Republican Party. We're not proud about that. But look at us today. We're a diverse party. You know, Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, Alberto Gonzalez, the Bush administration was very conscious about having uh, a racially diverse administration uh, and, and tried to make outreach on issues of, of immigration and things like that. So they were trying to turn the page in this. But in the Trump era, we've gone completely in the other direction. And rather than apologizing for the Southern strategy, contemporary partisans have tried to pretend that it never happened, right? I guess that's easier than apologizing for something is to just pretend it never happened. And I think this is an effort to pretend that the Republican Party could not possibly be engaged in anything racist today because it has never been engaged in anything racist before, right? And so we saw on the part of people like Dinesh D'Souza or, or Carol Swain, who's a political scientist I talk about in the piece, to pretend that this was simply created out of whole cloth by liberals in the recent past and was something that, that wasn't really borne out by fact. It's uh, a little bit wild that, that they're trying to claim this, not the wildest thing that they're trying to claim right now, though, of course. Of course. Although, of course, I, I had heard of the Southern strategy, I think for so long, you, I, I've just heard in, in popular media things like the parties just switched places as if it yeah. was this passive thing, that there, there wasn't an action, a, an impetus behind it. Mm -hmm. So let's talk first about the, the reasons that this switch had to happen. So up through Reconstruction, of course, Black voters were voting for the Republican Party. The Republican Party was the one standing up for uh, for them. They kept voting for the party of Lincoln. So what happens in uh, really in the 40s to, to yeah. bring Black voters more to the Democratic Party? Well, before I even dive in, let me just say that you, we've got the right long framework here, right? I think a lot of people assume that this was a party switch that took place in 1964, and suddenly everybody just kind of moved to different sides, uh, when it was, in fact, something that began in the 1930s and stretched on into the early 2000s. It's a very long process. As, as I note in the piece, it's uh, I like to call it a glacial change, because it, it took that long, but also it thoroughly transformed the landscape it left behind, right? right. So yeah, so the, the real root of this uh, uh, come in really the 1930s uh, and, and early 1940s, when uh, the migration of African Americans begins to the Democratic Party, and it's not that the Democratic Party had embraced civil rights or racial liberalism or anything like that in the 1930s. This was still very much a party of segregationists, a party in a large part led by segregationists because of the power that Southern Democrats had in Congress. But but African Americans start to migrate to the New Deal for the reasons other people migrated to the New Deal and to the Democratic Party because their lives were being bettered economically. Uh, and so African-Americans uh, have this remarkable reversal. Uh, in 1932, they are the one group that is really stuck by Herbert Hoover out of this sense of loyalty to the party of Lincoln. In 1936, they almost completely flip and are overwhelmingly uh, voting for, for FDR. And again, they do so not because of the party's racial stance, but in spite of it. But once African-Americans are part of that Democratic coalition, suddenly Democratic leaders are starting to think about them as a constituency they have to respect. So their presence in the party, regardless of any civil rights change, starts to inform what the party does. There starts to be, it's, it, it's some symbolic things early on. Uh, a Black preacher gives the invocation of a 1936 Democratic convention, things like that. Nothing much more serious than that. But by the late 40s, uh, the, th the, the, the situation has grown um, uh, incredibly tempting for Democrats to get involved on this, as things like the white primary have been struck down, as black voters in the North are becoming much more powerful. And it occurs to uh, Harry Truman, 
uh, that the time has come to make civil rights a national issue. He has a, uh, a presidential commission that looks into civil rights in 47 and 48. Everybody thinks Harry Truman, this kind of border state uh, figure who's not especially known for being racially liberal, is probably just going to uh, put a rubber stamp on this uh, of this committee and uh, uh, put the report in a, in a filing cabinet. But he leans into it. He embraces these very liberal proposals and makes civil rights a rallying cry for the Democratic Party in 1948. There's a, a speech that Hubert Humphrey gives at the National Convention, which he says, we've got to walk out of the shadow of states' rights and into the bright sunshine of human rights. And of course, it's that convention where the, the Democratic Party uh, follows Truman's lead and embraces civil rights in its platform that leads to the walkout of Southern segregationists, uh, the Alabama and Mississippi delegations walk out. And a few weeks later, they form the state's rights Democratic Party in Birmingham, commonly known as the Dixiecrats. And so that's the first real fracture here. And once the Democratic Party has committed itself to civil rights and, importantly, exposed that that old Southern Democratic core of the party might be up for grabs, might be willing to leave the party, suddenly you have an interest in the part of Republicans. And this is, was one of the things that, that I found out that actually surprised me as I got into this was that the Southern strategy, while it peaks in the 60s, really has its roots immediately in the Dixiecrat Rebellion of 1948. Because as soon as this happens, Republicans are down in the South trying to recruit these disaffected Democrats and saying, don't go back to the Democratic Party you left. Look, we believe in states' rights too. The head of the RNC goes down in 1952. Tells a crowd in Alabama on a Lincoln Day speech, it's great, tells them that, <laughs> you know, Dixiecrats believe in states' rights, Republicans believe in states' rights. We should have common cause here. There's a, a Republican senator named Carl Munt who tours the country for years in the late 40s and early 50s, explicitly preaching that we need to have a merger between the Republicans and the Dixiecrats. We all believe in these same things. Let's get together and make it happen. Now, it doesn't happen, obviously, at that level, but you start to see some of those early Dixiecrats are supporting uh, um, Eisenhower in the 1950s, are starting to break with a party, but the seeds are laid there in that moment. So it's, it's a really long process, but really starts to gain traction but by the early 50s. And especially in these early days, this isn't like dog whistle, like we think of it, like they're pretty overt about the racism and the, this is why you should come to the Republican Party. Yeah, they're very, I mean, the, the Republicans for their part try to speak in a little bit of code words, but the Dixiecrats they're, uh, they're luring are very open about this. And, and when they switch, there's no, again, this is why it's it's so amazing to say, you know, um, that this was invented by historians. It's all over the record. So when when they switch, and it's, it's really in the 60s that you start to see finally people at the congressional level uh, are starting to switch. You start to see really the first new wave of, of Southern Republicans in Congress. They're quite explicit about this. Bill Dickinson, who is one of the first Republican congressmen from Alabama in the 20th century, says when he switches from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party, I have joined the white man's party. That they're going to stand up for what, what we believe in, right? The, the, the Mississippi Republican Party in 1964, in its platform, embraces segregation and white supremacy, right? Uh, the, the first Mississippi congressman elected in 1964 from the Republican Party, what's the first place he goes after he wins election? It's a, it's a, a, a speech before uh, the Americans for the Advancement of the White Race or something like that. It's a Klan group. So again, they're not subtle about this at all. And it's not that Southern Democrats are racial liberals on this. They're still segregationists. But Southern Republicans have realized that if they can act just like Democrats on that issue— well, then they're also conservative on issues of labor, on issues of, of economics and things like that. It's a much better fit, right? So they've neutralized the one advantage the Democratic Party had, which is that it was the party of segregation and said, well, me too. And that's their inroad. So let's talk a little bit about this split. So it, this happens, this whole Southern strategy and the effectiveness of it happens sort of from the top down, like the, it works first at the presidential election yeah. level. And it takes a really long time to get into the state legislature level. So why, why is that? Why is there Yeah, that yeah, that's a, that's a very important process. Is this doesn't happen all at once, and it does have this kind of, it's what um, a couple of political scientists call um, trickle-down realignment, right? And it happens because I think uh, American loyalties to the political parties are the loosest at the presidential level, right? There's a way in which presidential candidates are 
uh, are, are kind of battles of personalities and they change from time to time. There are some people who are diehard and will always pull a lever, but there are people in the middle who will oscillate between the two parties, right? And so on matters of civil rights for Southerners, uh, this becomes starkly clear very quickly. Uh, and it happens between 60 and 64. In 1960, the two parties are basically the same on civil rights. Neither one is especially uh, progressive, but they both are maybe kind of center left. John F. Kennedy runs uh, on, a, on a platform and to, uh, to appeal to some uh, Northern uh, African Americans. But Richard Nixon in the Republican Party actually has a more liberal Republican platform on this. I mean, I mean, it's it's it goes on and on for pages. You can read this. It's detailed proposals. He really wanted to outflank the Democrats on this, right? Well, uh, it fails. And when it fails, Thurston Morton, the head of the RNC, meets with uh, Nixon and Eisenhower, and, and they basically say, uh, to hell with a black vote, you know? And this is the start of the Goldwater approach, uh, in which he says uh, at a meeting in, uh, of Republicans in Atlanta, we got to go hunting where the ducks are. And in the South, that means going after white conservatives. So over the next few years, you start to see the parties really change. It ha happens as Democrats lean further into civil rights and Republicans pull back. And it really comes into relief in 1964, where Lyndon Johnson is the incumbent president and somebody who had been a segregationist in Congress for 20 years, just like any other Southern Democrat. But by the time he has national ambitions, he's starting to promote civil rights causes. And in 64, he has leaned all in on the Civil Rights Act of 1964, made it much tougher than Kennedy had ever proposed, really leans in on this, and selects Hubert Humphrey as his running mate, the man who put civil rights on the map in 1948. Okay, that's the Democratic side. The Republican side is Barry Goldwater, who's not personally a segregationist, but importantly, voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And as his running mate, it's William Miller, who had been head of the RNC, who oversaw the recruitment of segregationists uh, in the South. So they're basically the Southern strategy personified. And once you have that picture in place at the presidential level, well, it's a stark choice. And so whatever loyalty Southern Democrats might have had to that party, they see Barry Goldwater saying all the right things and Lyndon Johnson saying all the wrong things, and they split on that. And so this is a, a remarkable moment. So the Republican Party had gotten very little of the uh, of the vote in the South previously. I think in Mississippi, it's something like 30% in 1960. In 1964, it's 87%. I mean, they, it, it's, a, it's a huge turnaround. In fact, the only states Goldwater wins outside of his home state of Arizona are these deep South states. So that presidential level happens almost immediately. And you can look at the uh, the share of, uh, of the black vote is a great way to, 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 to trace this. It craters in 1964. It doesn't really recover after that, right? It really is a realignment on uh, on the presidential level. The congressional level is entirely different, and it's different because a these these, these uh, senators especially have these long tenures in Congress. And I think this is the biggest mistake people make about the party switch: is they say, "Oh, well, did the senators switch?" No, they don't switch. Uh, Strom Thurmond is the famous example, but Strom Thurmond switches parties. Because all of his power is protected. Power you have in Congress, and this time it's especially pronounced even more so than today, comes through your seniority, right? And so if you were a senior Democrat, as many Southern Democrats were, they were the ones who've been elected the longest. And if you were in the majority party, as the Democratic Party was, you could be assured a committee chairmanship, right? Or, or, or a very strong uh, ranking role. That gives you a lot of power. But if you switch parties, your clock starts over, and you're now the most junior member of the minority party. You go back to square one. No 65-year-old, 70-year-old politician is going to start over that way, right? So they just ride out their careers uh, in Congress. Strom Thurmond got a special deal that preserved his committee seniority, and he took it. The Republicans weren't willing to give that to everyone who wanted to switch. So these conservative Southern Democrats, guys who are getting 100% rating from the American Conservative Union, they're very conservative. They just happen to be Democrats. They write out their careers in a Democratic Party. But when the new generation comes up, they instruct their aides and their friends, start your career, because you're starting from scratch, started it as a Republican, right? So this is what happens with um, Trent Lott, senator from Mississippi, becomes Senate Majority Leader in the end of the 90s. He had been an aide to William Colmer, a Democratic representative, but a very segregationist guy, 
who've been talking about party switches for a long time. And when Colmer finally retires in the early 70s, he taps Trent Lott to run as his replacement, but tells Lott to run as his replacement as a Republican, right? And so that kind of pattern to varying degrees plays out across the South. So it's it, you've got to wait for this older generation to basically die out and be replaced by younger people who are running as Republicans. And so what's the role of Watergate in there then? Because that yeah. it, it slows things down a little bit from what it might have been. It really does. There's a moment in uh, it, when Nixon wins in 68. It's still not clear uh, how successful the Southern strategy will be because George Wallace is in there as an independent. There's a lot going on in 68. But in 72, he wins in a landslide and he blows out McGovern. And it's very clear to Southern conservatives where their allegiances lie. And they're very uh, impressed with Nixon. And there's a moment right after uh, the election uh, landslide where it seems like there is going to be a massive switch taking place, that Republicans in Congress are willing to grant some seniority uh, to Democrats who will join uh, their ranks. Uh, there's a, It's led by Joe Wagoner, who's a, 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 a Democratic congressman from Louisiana, a member of the White Citizens Councils down there, an ardent segregationist. Uh, who leads these negotiations. And it seems likely that they're going to get a lot of people to switch. The problem is, is then Watergate blows up. And suddenly, the Republican Party isn't this gleaming paradise where you want to be. It's suddenly under fire. Uh, and it's it's taking a lot of water. So a lot of these Democrats decide, no, actually, we're going we're, we're gonna to hold, hold tight and, and stay put. So you don't have those massive switches that you seem to be having in, in 73 uh, uh, really get called off by Watergate. Yeah. And then, of course, the, the Democrats run a Southerner in Jimmy mm -hmm. Carter uh, and do manage to get the presidency for, for four years. But then Reagan has his own version of the Southern strategy, but clearly is is also using it. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Carter is, is really an interruption here, not just running against uh, Watergate. I think anyone would have done well. But the fact that he's a, a born again Christian, a brand new concept in American politics at that time from Georgia, uh, he really cracks a lot of those Republican inroads. Uh, but the shine quickly comes off Carter, especially for Southern conservatives. Uh, evangelicals don't believe he's really one of them, despite his credentials, uh, largely because of his stances on abortion and gay rights and, and the ERA. And they rally around Ronald Reagan. Reagan himself, a former Democrat, makes this plea to Southern Democrats explicitly. He tells them, you know, I know what it was like. It only hurts for a second when you pull that lever for the first time. Uh, but he tells them over and over again that, you know, they're not leaving the Democratic Party, but the Democratic Party left them, right? And to come home uh, to the Republicans. And he does have his own version of the Southern strategy. And again, it's remarkable to hear people uh, like, you know, Dinesh D'Souza and, and Carol Swain insist that the Southern strategy was a fiction because we have Lee Atwater on tape talking about it. And he says in this famous tape, and it's often been misconstrued, this famous interview he gives in, in 1981 with The Nation, where he says, Oh, yeah, Nixon had a Southern strategy that was all about coded appeals to racism. That was racism through and through. He's very clear about this. So Lee Atwater, if you, if you don't trust me, Lee Atwater himself is talking about Richard Nixon's racist appeals and the Southern strategy. What Atwater says is what we're doing today is different. And we're not talking about open appeals to racism. We're talking about taxes and welfare. And he says, and then look, he says, you liberals are going to say those are just code words. But trust me, it's very different. Now, uh, I think he's overstating the difference here. Um, uh, given the appeals that Reagan made, he made a speech at the uh, Neshoba uh, County Fair, where um, uh, a famous uh, site of the Mississippi burning murders, uh, talking about states' rights. He would make references to welfare queens and, and things like that. There was enough coded racism there, I think, to, to, to see the, the linkages to Nixon's line. As a political scientist, uh, Angie Maxwell and Todd Shields have shown in a book called The Long Southern Strategy, what Reagan did was take those old coded appeals to racism and blend them with a couple other things, religious appeals to evangelicals and fundamentalists uh, on the conservative end of the spectrum, and a sort of anti-feminist fa family values politics, right? And that extended these appeals to the same kind of Southern conservative voters, but not just on a racial lens, right? There was a religious angle, a cultural angle, a gender angle. Uh, and, and that was the way in which uh, they deepened uh, that Southern strategy. Yeah. Yeah. So let's skip ahead a little bit. And you, you mentioned these uh, 
uh, apologies that the RNC has has done had done in you know 2005 and and later. How do we get from there to the postmortem that the Republican Party did after the 2012 election, saying we need to be friendlier to minorities, yeah. to Trump? Like, what what happens there? I mean, I think Trump happens. I mean, I, I think that postmortem, uh, the recognition that the Bush uh, era folks had, and I think some of it is sincere. I don't think I don't think George W. Bush was you know a racist. I think he really wanted to bring. Uh, racial minorities uh, into his coalition and was sincere about that, but it's a it's a it's a it's a slightly contested view, right? There are those within the party who see that as a misstep, uh, see that as a mistake. And so when he, you know, pushes for immigration reform, uh, it, it it blows up in his face, uh, largely because he doesn't have the kind of the the Fox News base around him. Uh, the post mortem happens in in 2012, and again they're saying we've got to you know uh, we we've got to keep up you know turning the page on this. Make it clear that we're not that old party, and that works for some people. But there's a minority uh, uh, within that a, a white group, but but a minority numerically uh, among the uh, the Republican ranks that resents that, and that becomes the real rallying uh, cry uh, of, of Donald Trump. Uh, he, that it's not you don't have to change. Um, in fact, what we need to do is we need to go back. We need to make America great again. Roll the clock back to that earlier period. Right now, I think you don't have to be, you know, have an actuarial table out here to see that this is a a, a losing proposition of a long term. He's, he's largely appealing to an older uh, uh, part of the party there uh, that's not going to last forever. But it's a part of the party that is dedicated, but comes out to vote. Uh, and as the rest of the field largely splits uh, that kind of George W. Bush legacy vote, Trump takes that lane and wins. And once he's got control of the party, the party bends around him, right? And so it's remarkable to see all the people who were criticizing Trump in 2016, Lindsey Graham saying this is going to be the death of the party, are, you know, licking his boots uh, a couple years later. And, and that just shows how much he, I think, bent it to uh, uh, to his will. Again, I don't think this has, you know, it maybe have legs for one more election cycle, but a long term, uh, demographically speaking, that's not going to work. Uh, so we're going to see a reckoning with this at some point, but in the short term, it, it worked fine for Trump to get elected. He'll try it again. So it's difficult, if not impossible, to imagine the Republican Party today winning without the South. We're starting to see, you know, Georgia has two Democratic senators, for instance. Could there be, will there be another alignment, do you think, realignment? Yeah, I, I think there absolutely will be. I mean, uh, American history is, is a series of these uh, these political reinventions. It will take you know, a couple devastating uh, losses nationally, I think, for the Republican Party to kind of come to terms with this. They have lost, what, five of the last six national elections in the popular vote. But thanks to the Electoral College, that has inflated their strength, uh, not just in the presidency, but in the Senate, right? And so the rules are kind of uh, delaying, I think, what would be a natural uh, realignment here. Uh, but sooner or later, uh, yeah, change will come. At least, uh, there's one thing about politics. It's never a, kind of a, a permanent state. And as the country changes, the political dynamics will change too. So how can listeners get Myth America? You can get it anywhere books are sold, online, uh, ideally in your in your local uh, 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 non-chain bookstore would be my preference. Uh, you find it at libraries. Get it wherever you can. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's terrific. I, I really enjoyed uh, reading it. Really, the whole thing. I mean, it's you know, it's a series of different essays, but uh, it goes together very well, and I think gives you a good overview of American history. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about? No, no, no. We hit it all. This was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. All right. Well, Kevin, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to Unsung History. Please subscribe to Unsung History on your favorite podcasting app. You can find the sources used for this episode in a full episode transcript at unsunghistorypodcast.com. To the best of our knowledge, all audio and images used by Unsung History are in the public domain or are used with permission. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram at unsung underscore underscore history or on Facebook at Unsung History Podcast. To contact us with questions, corrections, praise, or episode suggestions, please email kelly at unsunghistorypodcast.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, Please rate, review, and tell everyone you know. Bye. M-S-W.